So it's my pleasure to introduce Robert from uh, TrialPay, who's going to be uh, telling us uh, some different mechanisms of, uh, of monetizing games. I'm giving away little trivia prizes uh, to encourage audience uh, participation. So uh, the next question. According to the recent wireless intelligence report, which European country has the highest install base of mobile phones? It's not Switzerland. Sweden. There we go, Luca. Robert, it's all yours. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So this is what day three looks like. Uh, I, might, I might have one advantage. I only arrived this morning from Berlin, so I might have a slight energy advantage over some people here, and I will try to instill some of this energy in you with my presentation. So I hope that works. Um, so next couple of uh, minutes is about monetization, and I'll, I'll start with a, with a quick overview of the ecosystem and uh, how the, the numbers are panning out in general. And then in the second part, I will talk very concretely about uh, different types of uh, non-direct uh, monetization opportunities in uh, games. Uh, so my name is Robert Schneider, sorry. Quick introduction, uh, I work for a company called TrialPay, US-based company, uh, specialist in um, alternative payment methods and game monetization. I'm heading the European office uh, based in Berlin. So in general, the App Store ecosystem uh, is a still fast growing system, uh, which is fueled by the number of devices that are available in the market. And interesting thing is here, uh, so we're looking at three factors. We're looking at the size of the market, which is uh, close to reaching 1 billion plus devices around the world for both iOS and Android. Uh, second, it's the, the growth. It still continues to grow rapidly, and especially in the uh, last couple of months, the availability of cheaper uh, smartphones using Android operating systems have uh, um, resulted in a, in a further um, motivation, especially around the, the Android system. The third factor here, is, which is important, is a change from paid to free, uh, freely available apps. And um, this is something that we will look a little bit uh, more in detail uh, in one of the next slides. Second statistic. Uh, this is about the, the dominance of in-app purchases uh, when it comes to monetization. So what we see here is, first of all, that on both leading system, systems, the uh, majority of the top 50 apps actually have some kind of in-app purchase mechanisms. Um, also, when you look at the total percentage in this growing market, the percentage of revenue coming from inner purchases is also increasing. The, the reason why that is, uh, is, is, is twofold. So on, on the one hand, we have the, the, the paying users who actually appreciate buying an app and then using it. Uh, then we have two user profiles. Um, we have the users who are not willing to pay up front, so who, who are only going for the free versions to test it, and then their willingness to pay increases. The second one is the, the power user who's actually willing to continuously spend money inside uh, the game, uh, which results in, uh, of course, higher revenue from this portion of the users. Um, why is it difficult still, even though this ecosystem has this enormous size, so why is it still a challenge for all game developers to monetize their games? First of all, uh, the sheer size of the app stores, this example comes from, from Apple, uh, shows that there are around 130,000 games available. And if you look for a very generic uh, type of game, like in this example, slots, um, it's very difficult to find the best game in this, uh, among these 1,500 games that are listed. So the, the actual organic di discovery of apps is something that is uh, becoming more and more difficult for the users and also more and more random. And for the developers, this actually means that despite having this huge pool of users and, um, and uh, the exposure to this massive audience, 
uh, you still need to direct users to your app to find you, which means there are uh, uh, paid user acquisition methods which must be applied by almost all developers to actually target their user base and build up their user base. So last slide for the uh, introduction is the, um, the disparity between uh, the, the user acquisition costs and the average revenue per download. This example, which is a little bit mathematical, but it, it shows a general problem, is that the average cost per download for a loyal user is almost double as high as the average revenue per download for paid apps. And there are several other ways of looking at this data, but in general it means that the revenue coming from uh, the, the acquired users will most likely not suffice for the developers to be uh, profitable, which means that other possible monetization channels should be explored. So what are these other possible monetization channels? First of all, this is the, the, the three green topics is what we looked at. We looked at paid apps, we looked at paid apps with in-app purchases, and free apps with in-app purchases. And this is the direct revenue that can come in. And now we're looking at concrete examples for partner revenue. And this goes from, from uh, advertising up to branded versions of apps. So let, let's look at examples and let's look at um, also different ways of doing this. So um, first of all, the, this chart here shows that it's an it's a trend that can be denied uh, from within two years. The, uh, the black sector, the, the, the free apps, possibly with in-app purchases, have taken over the ecosystem. And uh, this is driven by, by user demand, of course, but it's also driven by the developers who are uh, going into this, let's call it price war, offering their apps for free, uh, with very similar models, very similar types of games. And this is some, something that every developer today has to, uh, has to simply accept and uh, uh, decide what the result of this uh, current view of the uh, distribution of paid versus free apps means for them. Um, this next look puts all the types of partner revenue that we see back here into the life cycle of a typical game. And what's interesting here and what's probably missing in the slide is that there is a point which could be here, which is actually the launch of the game. So our advice or our experience is that there are certain types of monetization uh, through partners which should actually be looked at in the, in the design of the game and in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the development of the game before the launch. What many partners that we are talking to still do is that once the app is launched, they have either reached a significant size or they're looking to reach a significant size, this is when they first start thinking about monetization. And uh, we think that it's actually better to incorporate this into the product strategy from the start, especially when it comes to these four types of, of advertising or additional revenue coming from games. When we look further, um, this is not just the, the time, this is not just the, the life cycle, but it also depends on the actual uh, uh, growth of the game in terms of user base, in terms of uh, uh, building up a brand. So not every game will ever develop the size that branded versions of the app or even licensing becomes interesting. Um, but we look at some examples where this worked out beautifully. So first type of partner revenue is uh, a display advertising. It's uh, pretty traditional. It is uh, either banners inside the game or it's interstitials, uh, which force the user to actually interact with the uh, advertising in some way or the other, and um, this can be done in multiple ways, uh, and it's an easy and quick way of generating additional revenue, given that there is a, a sizable user base uh, to expose these ads to. 
And uh, with all types of advertising, it de depends a little bit on, on where your user base is. Uh, Western European countries, uh, uh, the US, uh, Latin America, etc., uh, have very good opportunities of filling inventory. And um, there are other markets where there's uh, a less or a smaller choice of vendors for this, and probably also less inventory at lower price points. Negative thing here for the users is, of course, that it's annoying. Uh, it disturbs the game. It, uh, it also lowers, potentially lowers the value of the game if the user is uh, distracted. Um, and because in order to have scale across different countries, that means that the developers actually have very little control over which types of ads are showing because they are run through ad networks, which are oftentimes blind. Uh, so the, ad, the developer doesn't know what kind of ad the user in France or in Brazil sees. Second opportunity is uh, an offer wall, which means uh, it's an alternative way for users to receive virtual currency. It's a, it's a direct uh, uh, alternative to payment methods, uh, to direct payment methods, um, which incentivize and reward users for interacting with brands. Um, good way is here that it actually uh, speaks to the 95 to 97% of the users who would never interact via direct payment. Uh, and it is a pretty easy installation. It's, a, it's basically a, a carefree implementation for the developer. And um, it can be customized to have the look and feel of the app. So it's a very integrated experience. On the downside, it means that users simply have to spend money elsewhere. They are paying for, these, for the virtual currency inside the game, either with their personal data when it comes to lead campaigns, etc., or they're paying with their time when they are watching uh, a video ad, uh, or they are paying with their credit card when they are buying something in order to get a certain amount of virtual currency in the game. And again, uh, because these are very often um, a brand advertisers, um, uh, these are direct response campaigns, performance campaigns, etc. There might be limited inventory of these campaigns in some markets which are simply not as developed when it comes to the the uh, performance marketing in general. This is potentially the next big thing. Uh, mobile devices are uh, like with the user when the user is like going through town. Uh, there are statistics about where users actually use their phones. It's not just the bathroom, it's also on the road, on the commute to work, etc. And um, connecting this online world, this mobile online world, to actual offline purchases is a huge opportunity which has, which has just started to emerge. So how it works is the user enters their uh, payment or debit card information in order to qualify for a certain reward coming from an offline um, uh, merchant, such as a Starbucks coffee. It could be... Um, shopping at the body shop, uh, or it could be uh, buying a pair of jeans at Gap, at the Gap. Um, and how it works is that after registering their payment information uh, and going to the actual shop, which is close to where they are currently, when they pay with that same uh, card, this is tracked back to the game and the user is actually notified in near real time about the reward for their actual purchase. And this is, a, of course, an opportunity that broadens the, the possibilities of advertisers beyond the advertisers who are online. Um, and it also uses the advantages of the mobile devices in a way that we don't see today. Uh, let's talk about the two different kinds of video ads. So on the left-hand side, we have the user-initiated videos, which means that 
uh, the user is actually rewarded a certain amount of virtual currency for interacting with the video. Um, user initiated is positive for the quality. It means the user decides uh, uh, to actually uh, first select the type of video they want to watch, then they actually actively start it, uh, watch it from start to finish in order to get some uh, virtual currency. Um, on the right-hand side, we have the interstitials, which are more a different way of the banner ads that we looked at before. Uh, sometimes they are even auto-played and they are disrupting the game experience, sometimes uh, unwanted by the user. So potentially the price point here is lower and the user experience is not as good as with the uh, user-initiated videos. Um, still, uh, watching a video on the mobile screen is something that many users find cool. Uh, so this is a very attractive and quick way um, of, of getting additional revenue for developers. Um, and there are some downsides here, and the biggest downside probably is the low fill rate. Uh, video, video on mobile still makes up only 5% of all video advertising. Uh, it's growing fast, but it still hasn't reached the, the advertising world. The message hasn't reached the advertising world. Uh, so it's also our job to make sure that there is a lot more available inventory. Uh, last two slides, now we're coming into an area which is probably only interesting for developers who have a massive user base and a very big brand around their games. Um, so customizing the in-game uh, in -game experience around brands, like we see the Farmville examples uh, for Lady Gaga, or we see items in the game which are branded. Uh, this is something that happens when the games have a huge audience and when big advertisers who are actually somehow in the area of the game or who can identify the target group of the game with their own target group um, <clears throat> make this possible. And uh, there are also examples where the actual uh, placement of the item has an effect on the game. Like uh, in the US, there was a campaign by an insurance company who had a, a Zeppelin who would make sure that your crops in a farm game don't wither. Uh, so there's an actual um, metaphorical connection between the ad and the game. Last couple of examples around uh, branding the game. Uh, this Temper Run example uses the, the, the Disney film to create a, a branded version which is, has its own levels. Uh, it's a completely new game which is built on the framework of the existing game. Uh, this is highly interesting. Uh, I know this example from my kids because they actually preferred the branded version which they knew from the movie over the original version so that it can activate, when the target group is right, it can activate the users to actually play more and spend more. But again, this might be an opportunity that uh, doesn't come across every day. That's the end of my examples. Um, I'm open for questions. I think we have like five minutes for questions. Any questions for Robert? Or well, maybe I'll start with a question. Sure. Offer walls sometimes have a good impression on people and sort of bad impression on people. And sometimes some of the offers that appear on the offer walls can seem a little bit scammy. In your experience with uh, how much control as a developer would I have in describing the offers that appear on my product so as not to damage my brand? Uh, good question. Um, First thing here is, uh, because of the type of deep integration into the game, um, most of the time uh, a developer should choose one vendor for the offer wall. And of course that vendor choice should also be influenced by the quality question. We have seen this a couple of years back on, on Facebook when the, um, the entire alternative payment industry was disrupted by the Scamville scandal. And, um, I think we have to make sure that this doesn't happen again on, on, on mobile devices, on the smartphone and tablets, uh, because uh, it's still early days uh, for, this, for, this, for taking this business model to the mobile devices. And we have one problem here with the ecosystem that e-commerce on mobile devices isn't as mature as it is on the web. Uh, so the, there are actually a smaller amount of opportunities uh, for the users to interact and for the offer wall providers to find vendors. So it's smaller ge geographies like the, the countries in which these offers, in which you find the, the high quality offers um, uh, are, are smaller. 
and also the, the sheer number of offers is also smaller. But this is a challenge that all the offer, offer wall providers have to face. And if developers are pushing for the quality question, then this will actually lead to a very healthy ecosystem. There's one more question over there. I have a quick follow-on question before we go through. Do you have any statistics or experience about the people who tend to use the offer wall, uh, whether there are people who wouldn't pay any other way, but since it seems for free for an offer wall, they will use those offers and nothing else, as mm -hmm. opposed to people who will pay through other microtransaction payments and then choose an offer wall to augment their experience and then go back to regular? Is there a difference between the different people? This is information that we, <coughs> sorry, that we only get from our clients. It's, uh, we, we can only track all the information that happens within our system. Um, so our clients are telling us that there is little to no cannibalization with their direct payment methods. And that there is an overlap of people who use both. Who like sometimes hunt for offers and sometimes use direct payments. These, these would be the, the profile of the power users. Um, but there is a sizable proportion uh, of people who would never pay, but who use the offer wall regularly to look for video CPL campaigns, buy something that they like, etc. And of course, this is made possible by targeting technology, which means that a female-oriented game would um, would see offers like the Body Shop, etc., where a male-oriented game uh, would would see uh, uh, offers from uh, ele electronic dealers, etc. Could you elaborate a little bit on the Starbucks example? Is there a market already for, for that type of advertising or, or tie-in advertising? And um, what kind of game would be suited for that? I think all games would be suited for that. Uh, it, it's, the, it's the users who are on the go. We know how many users are actually, uh, we know where the users are. And we, we can also track where, uh, um, like where the users are, are going when they are not actually at home. And everybody does 95% of their uh, daily needs offline. Maybe, maybe it becomes more and more online, but uh, still you go to the coffee shop, you go to uh, a restaurant, uh, uh, you buy your, your groceries on the way home, etc. These are all opportunities here. So actually the, the, the the size of the opportunity might be bigger than online. It's more about the, the user behavior of, of showing the users that there is a new way of uh, financing your in-game progress. Uh, but uh, technically and in terms of interest coming from these big uh, companies like Starbucks, etc., this is already there. This is currently live uh, in, the, in the US. There are already uh, a number of brands who work with trial pay in this way, and it's, it, it, it works beautifully. Um, it can be a credit or a debit card. It has to be some kind of payment card that can be identified. It has to be the same card that you use in the shop. And in, in the back end, uh, these two informations are connected, and the user is messaged like for any other offer uh, that uh, they did the purchase and received the virtual currency. Market example of anybody doing this? So on, on the game side? A game where this is impl implemented, where uh, I can this look is, it up? They're, they're like everybody who, everybody who uses uh, trial pay as an offer wall provider benefits from these examples because uh, it, it is just one of the offers that is on the offer wall. Um, so it blends in with all the online CPA, CPL, etc. offers. It's just another way of monetizing the game. Okay, well, we've run out of time for questions, but I know Robert will be here uh, after the presentation to answer any more questions. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you, Robert.